you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 1. And would you stand for the reading of the word of the Lord? Luke chapter 1 and ushers, if you'll stay there, I'll be with you in a minute. Luke chapter 1, and I want to speak to you this morning on something a little bit different, entitled The Anatomy of a Mother. The Anatomy of a Mother. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. There were in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both well advanced in years. Let's pray. Father, we love you today. We are so grateful for the presence of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you now that your anointing and your power is going to touch us as only it can. And we pray that you'll send the preacher that your glory will manifest itself throughout this place today in Jesus' precious name. And all the church shouted hallelujah. hallelujah. You may be seated. Today is a special day in the life of every mother. I got to tell you, this week was a pretty busy week for me, but as I was thinking about this morning's services, I kept thinking over in my mind, I want to say something different. I want to come at this Mother's Day thing from a little bit different angle. You know, I've, I've been a pastor now for almost 20 years, a senior pastor. And I think almost every Mother's Day that I can remember, I've been preaching uh, these Mother's Day services. So, you know, you preach them 20 times and uh, you have to kind of think about some things to say a little bit different. And ladies, you are very, very, very special to us. As I begin to think about this Mother's Day, I begin to think about what does it and how does the things happen in a woman's life to make her a great mother? Now, I know something this morning. I know this day is hurtful to some of you because some of you didn't have a great mother. Some of you, your mother is not here for the first time or maybe Mother's Day is dragging up some bad memories or maybe this Mother's Day one of your children is not with you or Maybe one of your children has gone on into eternity. I don't know. But I do know this, that the Lord loves you and He wants to touch you this morning in a special way. And as I begin to think about Mother's Day, I realize there's a lot of different definitions of what a mother can be. But I'm very fortunate as an individual because the three mothers in my life have been pretty spectacular. I grew up with a wonderful mother who loved me and saw me through some things and then I married a Jelly, and I just happened to, my mother's birthday is June 8th. That's my birthday. My mother-in-law's birthday is June 8th. So, you know, I'm not forgetting anybody's birthday. You understand? <laughs> I've got a built-in, I got gotcha. you. So, you know, <laughs> my mother, I just, I think I got the greatest mother-in-law in the world. Uh, what makes you say that? Because she never bothers me. Amen. I mean, I, <laughs> she keeps her nose out of our business, and I just love her for it. Amen. Now, uh, and she lives an hour and 45 minutes away. No, just, just teasing. Uh, but I've got a great mother, and, and I've got a great mother-in-law. But I want to tell you, the best lady is the lady I married, because I think she's the greatest mother, because she's the mother of my children. She's done a wonderful job. So I've been fortunate. All three people in my life that are close to me that form that mother entity in my life, have been wonderful people. You see, ladies and gentlemen, I begin to think about what makes up the anatomy of a great mother. And the word anatomy is defined as the structural makeup of an organism. And in thinking about this, I believe I can tell you the three greatest parts of a mother's anatomy. But before I do, I want to honor some special moms today with roses. And I'm going to ask that every single mom in this, in this place today, would you just lift your hand just right now? If you're a single mom, a single mom, Single mom, lift your hands and keep them up if you're a single mom. And then I want to ask all of you ladies who you have lost a child, I want you to raise your hand because I want to give you something. I just want to tell you today that we love you. We're thinking about you. We're standing with you. You're special to us. And First Assembly of God cares about you. Could you give our single moms and those that have lost children... Just keep them up. They're coming. Ushers, keep looking. Keep looking. Keep looking. There's some. Go right there quickly. Hand them. 
and uh, guys get them to him in the balcony in the main floor. Uh, just hurry as quickly as you can and you're missing one down front, Daryl, right in front of you, right there. It's got a hint right there. Okay. We want to make sure everyone gets one. All right. Notice with me, there are many of you mothers who don't fit that bill. Thank God that you have people to celebrate this Mother's Day with you. And we're thankful for that. But to those that didn't, I just wanted to tell you last night about 10 o'clock I was praying for you. And I just wanted you to know the Holy Spirit put you on my heart. And we were letting you know that we love you and we care about you and you're special. And uh, you, may be, you may be feeling alone, but I just want to tell you you're not alone. Because the body of Christ loves you and we're standing with you. Amen? I want us to look at the anatomy of a great mother. What are those characteristics that make a great mom? Now... Please understand that I have really only one reference point. That is the Word of God. And I have a little bit of another reference point, and that's my own personal experience. And so I'm going to tie both of those together, but the foundation of what I'm going to say this morning is the Word. Notice with me the anatomy of a mother's mouth. You say a mother's mouth is part of her great anatomy? <laughs> Some of you, you say, boy, that preacher... <laughs> Something's wrong with him. I've had enough of my mother's mouth. Don't say amen. <laughs> and I don't want anybody saying amen about their mother-in-law's mouth. <laughs> oh, it got quiet. <laughs> Luke, <laughs> oh, Luke chapter 1, verse 6, Bible says that both were righteous before God, walking in the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. So how does... Elizabeth's mouth become one of the most important parts of her anatomy as a great mother. Well, first of all, in verse 42, notice with me that Elizabeth's mouth was reserved for prayer and praise. In verse 42, Elizabeth's about five or six months pregnant, seven months pregnant with John the Baptist. She goes to meet her cousin, who just so happened to be Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was carrying Jesus to Christ. And then she meets her and she spoke out with a loud voice, the Bible says, and said, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of the womb. Now, I don't know about you, but here is Elizabeth who was probably approaching 50. She had never had a child. And here she is having to share the glory with this 16-year-old little cousin. But notice with me something about Elizabeth that is very interesting to me. In all the years that she went barren, Elizabeth didn't get bitter, she got better. Now, I want to say something to you today, ladies. In that day and time, in the culture of the day that Jesus was born and John the Baptist was born, if you didn't have a child, you were nothing. In fact, in that day and time, women, uh, they were on the real high level. Thank God that Jesus came because he elevated and made aware people aware that women were co-heirs in the kingdom of God. But in the Jewish mind of that day, this is what they would pray. Thank God I am not a Gentile, a dog, or a woman in that order. Now, how many of you glad you're living today? Now, ladies, in that day, women were looked at to be baby machines. And I, I hope nobody in here still looks like that. But anyway, that's what they thought they, they were supposed to function. And can you imagine how Elizabeth must have felt the one thing that her society says she was supposed to do, she couldn't perform and function in. And yet, and through all of this heartache and negative things that she was facing, she never got bitter, she got better. Notice with me, Elizabeth wasn't a complainer, she was a companion to her husband Zacharias. And I want to tell you that if there's one thing that is important, ladies, that you do, it is to believe in your child. Even if no one else believes in them, you must believe in them. It's so critical because the future of your son and daughter and very much will depend on the fact of whether you believe in them or not. Notice with me that Elizabeth's mouth was not only reserved for prayer and praise, but secondly, her mouth was prophetic. In verse 43, the Bible says, But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? She was prophesying that Jesus was to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. You notice with me in Scripture that Jesus said, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. 
And ladies, <clears throat> you need to understand today that with your words you can speak life and with your words you can speak death. You and I need to come to an understanding that ladies, you are probably the most powerful person in your child's life. Now, as a father, I don't like to say that. I wish I didn't say that. But I got to tell you that most of the time, probably 85, 90% of the time, as mothers, you are probably the most powerful person. And I have seen some things that have happened lately that have just astounded me. I was in the airport the other day making a trip, and I was there, and there was this mother cursing her son publicly. Kid was about seven or eight years old, and she was just winding up and letting him have it. I was raised in a military home, and I've been on ships and military bases, so when they say he curses like a sailor, I actually know how the sailors curse. But I'm telling you that this lady was making me embarrassed. She was saying words I hadn't heard even being around military bases. And I kept thinking to myself, my God, she's destroying this kid. And ladies, you and I need to understand something. Parents, understand something. What comes out of your mouth can make or break your child. It can make or break who they are. It can make or break what they do. You know, the Bible says, guys, it's better to be on a rooftop than in a house with a nagging woman. Don't say amen right now. But ladies, don't drive us up there. We don't want a staircase built to the roof. You know what I'm saying? We would rather dwell in the house with you. You smell better. You look better. Amen. We want to be there. And I want to tell you something. Not only does the husband go to the rooftop when your mouth is not right, your children go to the rooftop. Well, don't say amen. But notice with me that Elizabeth had that type of mouth that was prophetic. She spoke the word of God into her children's lives and it changed who they were. Not only was her mouth prophetic, but notice with me, Elizabeth's mouth was passionate. In verse 60, the Bible says that John's mother answered her and said, no, he shall be called John. Let me tell you the story. Most of you know it. But Zacchaeus was one of the priests. He's going in the temple. He's offering up uh, a sacrifice to the Lord. And the angel Gabriel visits him. And Gabriel says to Zacharias, he says simply, Listen, I know your wife and you are past the age of bearing children, but we're going to visit you and your wife's going to conceive and you're going to bear this son and he's going to be called John. And he's going to operate in the prophetic realm of the office of the prophet Elijah. And he's going to do great things for God. He's going to be the forerunner of the Christ, the Messiah. And Zacharias, he had a little hard time believing that. And he said, well, I don't know. You know, I don't know. And the angel said, because you doubted my word, you are going to be mute until the day that John is born. And the Bible says that's exactly what happened. In fact, it would have been, went longer than to the day John was born. Because the Bible says, on the eighth day after John was born, when all Jewish boys at that time were circumcised, that they brought, it was at that day that they named the child when you circumcised him. And they all wanted to name the child after Zacharias. And Elizabeth was so strong and passionate, she said, no, his name will be John. And at that time, God released Zacharias' mouth and he reiterated what Elizabeth had said. But I want you to understand Elizabeth's mouth was passionate because she believed what she said. And ladies, you must believe what God is speaking to you. You must believe what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. You must believe. And I want to tell you that I believe I grew up in a home. My mother was passionate. She was very passionate. I remember when I had the call of God in my life and sometimes I would try to run from it. My mother would say to me, you have the call of God on your life. No matter what you do, you can't run from the call of God. God is going to bring you back. She was passionate about that. I, I can remember growing up and my mother uh, reading to me over and over again 
the book of Proverbs every morning before we went to school. My mother read to me the book of Proverbs. She read to me about staying away from harlots, being morally pure, and she read all the time. And she told me very passionately, God's watching out for you, and God and I have an agreement. And if you do something wrong, he's going to tell me, then you're really going to be in trouble. I mean, that's what my mother told me. That's what I grew up. And after I got a little bit older, I thought that's a bunch of hogwash. But then what happened was I was about 15 years old. The only time I ever dabbled in alcohol and drank a half a beer one night, came home, found my mother on the, on the front couch in the living room on her knees praying, saying, God, don't ever let them drink another beer again. And I thought, oh, my God, it's true. <laughs> Everything I've been, I can't get away from this. She was passionate, passionate about what she believed. And because she was passionate, she taught me some things, and I embraced those things because I knew God was speaking to her. The second part of a woman's anatomy that makes her great is the anatomy of a mother's mind. In verse 23 of chapter 1 of the book of John, the Bible says, And so it was, as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. Now, after those days, his wife, Elizabeth, conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my approach from among the people. Three things you need to know about Elizabeth's mind. Number one, Elizabeth's mind had the ability to believe. She never put God in a box. God said, I'm going to let you conceive, even though you're past childbearing years. Elizabeth never doubted that. She believed you say, well, why did she hide herself for five months? I asked myself that question. You know, if a woman knows she's conceived and this is the first child, she seemed like she'd want to tell everybody. Elizabeth didn't do it. For five months, she kept silent. And I realized what she was doing. She was guarding her faith. Because, you see, if she'd have gone out immediately and told everybody she was pregnant, they would have said, oh, You've just missed your menstrual cycle or, oh, that's just wishful thinking. She would have had doubt and unbelief being spoken to her almost every single day. Heartache and ridicule and all that would have been spoken into her life. But Elizabeth rejoiced in God for five months. She put in her mind, look at what God has done. And then there came that great day when she could wear something to let everybody know, look. I am pregnant. I am going to bear a son. I, God has visited me. You see, she had in her mind the ability to believe. And I want to give a word to some of you ladies here this morning that your children are estranged or your children are not serving God. Or maybe the dream God had given you for your child hasn't been fulfilled. Let me tell you that as long as you have that dream for your child and your heart, then God can still do a miracle. You say, well, they're, they're married now. They're gone now. They, I don't have any control over their situation. I I want to tell you, as long as you keep dreaming the dream, God can do the miraculous in your heart and life. You see, I serve a God that even if they've been out there 15 or 20 years and messed up their life, when they come back to Jesus, he can make all that's wrong right in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. Give him praise if you believe that. The second thing about Elizabeth's mind was she had the ability to forget. You know, ladies, i got to tell you, you are amazing people. I cannot understand how you can forget the childbirth. I mean, you can give, you can be screaming and yelling one minute, give birth to the baby and think it's a wonderful thing. I mean, I am so glad my, I remember one particular time this Mr. Lamaz had me in there again. You know, I'm still going to meet him one day. But anyway... I was in there, and one of our kids was being born. Jelly's got me by the collar yelling, Give me some drugs! <laughs> I wanted her to get the prize for no, you know, no, but I realized you don't need the prize at that time. But anyway, give me some drugs. Three minutes later, the baby's being born. She's saying, oh, isn't he beautiful? And I said, or is she beautiful? And I said, oh, yeah, I'm just glad she's here. You know, one of us was going to die, but I'm glad she's <laughs> She can forget about it just that quick. And it's a gift that mothers have. Because a mother can forget the pain of a broken relationship when looking at the child conceived by it. You see, a mother, her mind is taken apart from the mind of God 
because God has the ability when he looks at us after we've received Jesus Christ as Savior, God has the ability never to remember the things we did before we were born again. In fact, he wipes it away with his mind and a mother can look at you and I and we could have been rascals and, and been arrogant and been destructive and hurtful and said and done awful things in our teenage and even young adult years. But a mother can look at you and say, oh, look at my baby, isn't he wonderful? And we all know that's not true. <laughs> but a mother can forget. It's a gift. I don't know about you guys, but I have a hard time forgetting sometimes. It's not easy for me to forget. But I'm amazed at my mother. She forgets all the times I told her I hated her. Forgets all the times I told her she was a bad mother. Forgets all the mean, ornery things I said. She just tells everybody what a wonderful, wonderful son she has and she called the other day said send me 20 books I've got them already sold I'm going to make her <laughs> the chief distributor amen <laughs> but she she forgets all that it's a gift of God and ladies that's what about God you're like is the ability to forget but there is something about the anatomy of that mind not only do you have the ability to forget but you have the ability a mother's mind never forgets. Now, wait a minute. You said you have the ability to forget, and yet you say she has the ability never to forget. Listen, a mother never forgets birthdays or anniversaries. A mother never forgets the weight of her baby and the cute little stories. A mother never forgets when her child was born. You know, recently... My wife is investigative. You know, she's always told you that I'm so curious that I like to find things out. I can't hardly wait. But I want to tell you, if it wasn't for her, I never would have found the whole story about the birthing parents and the whole thing. And, and as we've been going through this situation, I've met my birth parents and I've met my birth uh, on one side, met the birth parent and met the uh, birth brother and found out I have three sisters. I met them all and it's really been a God thing. But I found something out I didn't know. My brother told me that my birth mother and the uh, doctor she was having the affair with, whenever she would get pregnant, he would perform the abortion for her, even though it was illegal. So she had abortion after abortion. And a week after he went back to Iran to be with his real family, they found out she was pregnant. So I, that's how close I came to being a statistic one week. And I was talking with my birth mother, and she told me that when I was born, she didn't want to see me, look at me. Um, in fact, to be honest with you, that's the first time I've, as I talked with her, I felt any real form of prejudice was that first phone call. And as she told me, what they did is when she got ready to leave the hospital, they put me in a blanket, in a receiving blanket, and as they do, they put the blanket over the baby's head. She got in the car, they placed me in her hands, and she said, I wouldn't pull the blanket back because I didn't want to see you because I was afraid I couldn't give you up if I looked at you. And then she drove to the uh, attorney's office. He came and picked me up, and I was supposed to be his. So he didn't pull the blanket back and look at me either. And they, my mother was telling me this the other day. She said, son, they put you in my arms. I was sitting in a the car. They put you in my arms. She said, I pulled the blanket back. And this beautiful smile came on your face and you grabbed my finger. And she said, from that point on, you stole my heart. And I thought, I never would have remembered that. My wife can tell you when my girls had their first ball movement. I don't really care. You know, that's not something I want to remember, you know. But they remember things like that. They remember things like that. And my mother was going on and telling me all this stuff about how important that was and everything. And I thought, you know, God, the first mother I ever saw was the one you chose to raise me. 
And I thought about how the hand of God has it in mom's minds never to forget. And you know, I think about how God is. He doesn't forget the day I came to that altar and gave my heart and life to Jesus. He doesn't forget the day. I might not remember the exact day. I know it was in June sometime, but I can't remember the day that I was filled with the Holy Spirit and called to preach. But I can tell you who does. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost remembers that day. They remember the day at five years old. In fact, when I was back in New York just a couple weeks ago making contact, I took Jelly to the church, that Baptist church that I was saved in. I took her to the church and showed her how we walked down the aisle. And the whole thing, it was kind of like a memory lane type thing. And I can't remember the time that I did it. All I remember was it was sometime in the spring or summer because uh, my mom was talking about the rapture that morning. Morning and I knew I didn't want to be around when Antichrist was here. So I got saved at five years old, you know. And I can't remember that date, but you know what? When I get to heaven, my name's written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, and Jesus remembers that day. There's a lot of things that I can't remember, but Jesus remembers. And you and I may think that God doesn't understand and remember, but God remembers. But the third thing I want to share with you about the anatomy of a mother is a mother's heart. Look with me at verse 13. The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayers heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you call his name John. Verse 14, And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. I don't have time to read verses 15 through 17, but notice with me three things about Elizabeth's heart. Elizabeth's heart had to be challenged. Her child was going to be asked to do something very, very different from anybody else. And I want to tell you something. That when God calls your son or daughter to full-time vocational ministry, or God calls your son or daughter to do anything in His kingdom, sometimes it's difficult to let go. And Elizabeth had to know that if he was going to have the office of Elijah, Elijah had a gift of offending people. And the problem, that was one of his spiritual gifts. And the problem with Elijah's spiritual gift of offending people was the people he offended were kings and priests and people that could do bad things to him. So when the angel said, You're gonna ha your son is going to function in the office of Elijah, she had to know this guy is going to have a difficult life. But she was willing to do it and be challenged because God had spoken to her. Secondly, Elizabeth's heart had the ability to be broken. You know, when a mother's heart is broken, it's unusual how it doesn't become bitter. August 1st, I celebrate 10 years as being your pastor. And I remember the first Sunday of August was to be my first Sunday. And we moved in here, the, the, uh, the moving trucks brought our stuff in on that Wednesday, and we were getting settled and everything, and we took all day. We were unpacking boxes. We crawled into bed about 10 o'clock that night, and we got a phone call about 10.30. You need to come to the hospital. Because at that time, Woody and Marcia Gardner's son, who was about 16 or 17 years old, had had a tragic accident. His, this young man was called to be a missionary and had died in this car accident. I didn't even know how to get to the hospital. We went there and began to minister to them. And I want to tell you, for the last 10 years that I've been your pastor, I have watched that family. It's been incredible. I've watched how she's been able to love through that. I know her heart had to be broken, but I know how the Holy Spirit has used her to minister in our missions office. For years, she donated 40 hours a week and just gave and gave. I've watched Woody serve on this board and be faithful to God and do great things for the Lord. And I've watched how that they have chosen, even though their heart was broken, not to become bitter. I've watched as my wife has had a, an ability to deal with adversity and carry on even though I don't know how she does it. But she's had that ability too. And I want you to understand that that's the God-given ability of a mother. And ladies, some of your hearts may be broken this morning. Some of you may be disappointed about some things this morning. But you have a choice. Brokenness is a far cry from bitterness. Better to be broken and shed tears and weep and say, God, I don't understand, than to become bitter and say, I don't want anything more to do with that. The third thing is this, as our musicians come. Elizabeth's heart had the ability to be restored. Think about it. 
She lived about 45 years being childless. Her only real function in that particular society was to bear children for her husband. She had a high profile husband who was probably one of the high priests of that day. And in all the functions they went to, there were children everywhere. And in that day and time, in Elizabeth's day, the Jews believed that if you didn't bear children, God was judging you that you had sinned. Can you imagine the heartbreak and the difficulty she must have faced during all that time? But I want you to know, we serve a Jesus today that can repair the brokenhearted. In fact, in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And my word to you ladies this morning is you may have a broken heart, but I want to tell you we have a Jesus that can put the pieces of your heart together. Maybe your child didn't reach the level that you had aspired. Maybe you had never wanted your child to enter into drugs and alcohol and bondages. Maybe that was never your choice, but because of their own decisions, that's where they are today. Maybe you never wanted, and I know you never wanted your child to be involved in immorality, but it happened. Your heart's been broken. I want you to know that Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. In fact, mom, let me tell you something. Jesus came to touch you because if you have a broken heart, you're one of the reasons why Jesus came. He came because he loves you. He wants to touch your broken heart. And dad, if you're here or grandma or grandpa or maybe a son or daughter's here and your heart's been broken because of a family situation, maybe physical need or financial need, I want you to know Jesus came so that you could have life so that your heart could be and would be healed. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to stay that way. I got a letter this week. One of the ladies in our church, I won't take time to read it, but let me just tell you the gist of the letter. Her son recently died. An older son, and he was an adult and married with children and died. And the way that this particular daughter-in-law responded was not very kind. And this mother's heart was bitter and broken. But I got a letter from her today and she said, Pastor, last week, when you talked about in the midst of the storm, throw out the anchor of prayer, throw out the anchor of the word, throw out the anchor of the person of Jesus Christ. And when you've done all, throw out the anchor of faith, she said, during that time, I came to the altar, and when I came, Jesus healed my heart. She said, for the first time, I can rejoice my son's in heaven, and the bitterness and anger has left me. I want you to know, Jesus can restore your broken heart. You know, we don't like to talk about feelings and emotions in our society today. But, beloved, I don't know how people make it who don't know Jesus as their Savior. Life's hard. And you know, this is a pilgrimage that we're in and a journey we're having to make because one day when we see Jesus, the Bible says there'll be no more sorrow, there'll be no more sickness, there'll be no more disease, no more heartache. And you know what else, ladies? In Revelations, the Bible tells us that one day, He'll wipe every single tear from your eyes. There is coming a day, if you'll be faithful, you'll never weep again. You'll never have sorrow again. You'll never have heartache again. It'll never happen. It'll never be a part of you. So I say to you, my beloved sisters, if you can make it, just make up your mind to make it. Because Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. In the midst of your heartache, he's right there. You may not be able to see him, but he is right there. There may be times in your heartache, you may not be able to feel him, but he is right there. 
I base my life on that word. And in all the brokenheartedness that you've had, whether it's through spouses or children or sickness or disease, Jesus said, I will never leave you. There is a day coming when we see him face to face that we will rejoice. This is not heaven. So don't, no matter how good you may have it financially, educationally, societally, physically, this is not heaven. This is not heaven. This is a journey. This is a battle. But there's going to be a day when we hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. The Bible says in the book of Psalms that the tears of the saints are precious in the sight of the Lord and that the Lord gathers them all. And I believe one day that all the tears you've cried over all the brokenness of your heart, one day the Lord's going to give you a cup, maybe it's a barrel, that's filled with those tears. And you're going to be able to take that cup. And as David poured the water out from Bethlehem, when his, his men, his three mighty men went to risk to bring it to him, I believe you're going to be able to take the cup of tears in heaven and pour it out before the Lord and say, Lord, you were with me all the time. And you know what? That's the last of your heartache and your bitterness and your brokenness you'll ever experience. It's an offering unto the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you today. Hallelujah. Would you just begin to lift your hands and worship him? Father, we love you. We're so thankful that you promised us you would never leave us nor forsake us. God, there's some things we go through in life we don't always understand. But Lord, I don't know who these mothers are. I don't know who these sons are. I don't know the situation that the fathers may be going through. But last night, I know you spoke to me. And God, that's what I've tried to be obedient to do here this morning. And Father, I ask right now that the miracles that you said would happen would begin to happen in the name of Jesus. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, no one's looking, no one's moving. There's some of you sitting here next to your son or daughter, next to your mother or father. You're here in honor of them, but you've, maybe at one time you walked with the Lord, but you're not walking with them now. Maybe one time you served the Lord, but you're not doing now. Maybe you've never known the Lord. You want to give your mom and dad the greatest present? Let me tell you, the greatest present you could ever give to your parents is to know that you're born again and on your way to heaven. And you're here today and you're not right with God and you'll say, Pastor, I'm tired of running. I want to get my heart and life right with God. Would you slip your hand up all over this place? You're not right with God, but you want to be. Thank you. Others, just slip it up high and put it down. Let me see it in the main floor in the balcony. Thank you. Anyone else, quickly. Slip it up high and put it down. Thank you. Anyone else, slip it up high and put it down. Thank you. Anyone else, slip it up high and put it down. Thank you. Anyone else? Slip it up high. Put it down. Thank you. Anyone else? In the balcony. I'm not right with God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Everyone that lifted your hand, look at me. Look at me. Look at me. I'm going to ask you to do something. You may be sitting in the middle of a pew, but people will let you come. I'm not asking you to come join this church. I'm just asking you to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ. Jesus said in his word, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father, which is heaven. But he also said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father, which is in heaven. And at the count of three, I'm going to ask you to get up along with our altar workers. And I want you to come to this altar. 
and you're going to get things right with God. You say, what will people think? Listen, it doesn't matter what people think. All that matters is you and what you think and what God's doing in your life. As I count to three, you stand up, you excuse yourself, they'll let you out on the count of three. One, two, three. Come on, get up right now.